begin by respectfully acknowledging the Bidjigal people, who are the traditional custodians of the Aboriginal land on which this university stands, and particularly uh, welcoming the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students who are joining the Law School in this year's JD class. More generally, you, the JD class of 2015, include students from the length and breadth of Sydney, New South Wales, and across the country. A special welcome to the students amongst you who have come from at least 16 countries overseas, contributing to more than 40 countries represented in the law school body. Coming to UNSW involves more than just studying a few courses. You're coming to a law school which has a history, a tradition, and a culture, including values of engagement, respect, and commitment to justice, which sets it apart, and it sets you apart. You're special. We want to start by a commencement address uh, from one of Australia's uh, most respected and influential lawyers, who is an alumnus of this law school, Michael Rose. Michael is chief executive partner, uh, aka the boss, of Allens, a major international law firm operating in seven countries and which recently went into an alliance with Linklater's. Before becoming chief executive partner, Michael was head of the Allens litigation and dispute resolution department and a commercial litigator specialising in large scale commercial disputes. He acted for clients in significant disputes throughout Australia and the US, Europe and several Asian jurisdictions. He's practiced law in Australia, the United States and Hong Kong. Michael is a, a great example of a UNSW lawyer who sees it as his responsibility to contribute to the world around him. He says that, and I can quote from me, he encourages his firm to define itself by its broader community relationships. And Alan's has done so by real and substantial commitments to working with Aboriginal people and with refugees. There's also his own personal commitments. Notably, Michael chairs Child Fund, Al Child Fund Alliance, an international aid and development organization that supports children and their communities in 55 developing countries. Amongst his many other responsibilities, Michael is also the chair of Sydney Living Museums and the Indigenous Engagement Task Force of the Australian Business Council. He's a board member of the Committee for Sydney, a fellow of the Institute of Company Directors, and an ambassador of the Australian Indigenous Education Foundation. It's a great pleasure to ask Michael to come and speak to you today. Much, David. Hi, everyone. Uh, can I also acknowledge the Bidjigal people, pay respect to their elders, past and present? Um, I'm really very embarrassed by that introduction. I wish my mother had been here to hear it, but <laughs> I am uh, a little embarrassed about it. In my calendar for today, uh, my assistant put in uh, this event, and she said uh, when she typed it in, there's a keynote address from an important person in the legal community, and then helpfully she put in brackets after, that's you. Um, which was her way of pointing out that she doesn't believe it, and maybe that I shouldn't believe it either. Uh, as David mentioned, one of the things I do when I'm not doing my day job is I chair uh, a global NGO, and it operates actually now in 62 countries because we just added some new countries to our program. And those countries are the kind of countries that you would expect, countries in Central America, South America, uh, all the way through Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Southeast Asia, and some of our very near neighbours, places like Timor-Leste and Papua New Guinea, which even though they're very close to us geographically, are as far as you can get from us when you look at the UN developmental registers. And I want to start today by talking to you about why I think law matters. And I'm going to do that by telling you about an experience I had about 10 years ago when I was in Papua New Guinea uh, visiting some child fund programs in Central Province. Central Province is the, uh, the bit of New Guinea that runs off to the east 
and south of Port Moresby. And so we were there looking at some of our projects. We'd built some schools up in some mountainous villages and uh, we had been training the teachers in that place and we'd also been running some infant health and HIV AIDS programs up there. So we were up in the mountains during the day and we were heading back to Port Moresby, probably a drive the same as it would be from uh, Gosford or Wollongong back to Sydney. Uh, in Papua New Guinea that's an eight hour drive. And we were about two hours out of Port Moresby and we pulled in to a village and uh, we went up the hill in this village to have a look at the clinic um, that was there and to talk to the district nurse. And when we got up to the top of the hill where the clinic was, the clinic's a, a three-room building, the classic sort of clinic that you might see in a developing country, a place for women to have babies, for the babies to be uh, vaccinated, for people to come for emergency care. We got there and it was closed. It wasn't just closed, it was entirely boarded up. And the reason it was boarded up, uh, we found out later because the district nurse came out to talk to us, was that the national government had cut the funding for the clinic. And because the national government had cut the funding, the provincial government had switched off the electricity and the water. And because the electricity had been switched off, all the fridges that kept the vaccines cold had switched off and all the vaccines had been destroyed. Uh, all of the uh, sort of clean environment had not been able to be maintained. And so the nurse had just soldiered on with the supplies she had until um, they ran out and then she shut. And this is a clinic that probably served 10 or 15,000 people, most of whom would walk two or three days to get there. And while we were talking to her about this calamity, a, a man appeared, a man who was about 50, eight or 60, I don't know, late 50s, early 60s, and he was carrying a boy. And this boy was seven or eight, and I can remember it distinctly, because at the time, my sons were seven and eight. And this boy had a broken leg, a really badly broken leg. And uh, we uh, got into a conversation with this man about what to do. And our drivers, who all spoke um, the local language and, and pidgin English, and the nurse who spoke the local language, were talking to this man, and they were saying, this boy has to go to Port Moresby. He's got to go right now, go put him in hospital. And the man said, uh, well, we can't afford that. We can't afford the bribe that we will need to pay to get him into the hospital. We can't afford the medical bills that will need to be paid we can't afford to uh, buy the medicines or the food that we would need to buy while he's there. And we can't afford to get him back from Port Moresby when he's fixed because that costs three kina, which I think was about $3.50 at the time. And so we said, or I didn't say, but our district director said, look, Child Fund will do that. Right? We'll, we will pay and we will get him into the hospital, we'll get him fixed. And the man said, well, even if you could, it's too dangerous. Um, we don't have any family in Port Moresby. We don't have any Wontox there. There's nobody we can talk to who can help us. And so I, I, I can't send this little boy to that terrible, violent place uh, and expect to get him back. So he's not going. And we went round in circles like this for, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. And in the end, it was clear that the boy was not going to go to Port Moresby. And so one of our drivers went round to all the trucks uh, in our convoy and pulled out all of the first aid kits, got all the bandages, got all the antiseptics, got all the painkillers, gave them to the district nurse and said, OK, well, this is the best we can do for you. And as we got into the truck to head off, I said to our director, this isn't, this isn't right. This kid's going to be crippled for life. And the director turned to me and said, no, he's going to die. He's going to die in the next two weeks because in this country, if you break your leg like that, and if you're not cared for, and if you stay here, then you die. And so that's the answer. 
And I was appalled, absolutely appalled and overwhelmed that something that if it happened to my sons, I would take them to a hospital, which was less than half an hour away, they would be fixed, and they would be home the next day. And this kid was going to die. And as you can probably hear in my voice, 10 years later, I'm still appalled. But I thought a lot about it. And I thought, why is this? And there's all the simple answers, you know, it's poverty, it's development economics, it's how, how things work in the developing world. And some of you are um, from countries where you will have seen some of these things on the margins of your own countries or uh, on the margins of your neighbouring countries. But actually, as a lawyer, what happened to me is it came home to me that this is what happens when law doesn't work in your country. This is why law matters. And you notice that law matters when you're in a place where it's not. You know that law matters when it's not there. And that boy died because his country doesn't work. It doesn't work because its institutions don't work. And its institutions don't work because its laws don't work. He was failed by a failure of law. Economics as well, policy as well, global dynamics as well, but right down at the really basic level, the bureaucrats, the health people, the politicians, the governors, the people who should have run a system for him failed him. And so uh, for me, it was like an enormous reminder of how much the law matters, how much the rule of the law matters. And in our society, we tend to take it for granted because it's there. It underwrites everything we do. From the first light bulb we turn on when we get up in the morning to the last thing we do in the day, everything is regulated. Everything is safe. Everything is underwritten for us by the smooth operation of our law. But when it doesn't exist, that's when calamities happen. And so law matters. It matters to the functioning of our society. It matters to the health, well-being and prosperity of our community. And it matters for the realisation by people of their basic human rights. So what you're about to start on, what you're about to study, matters. It really matters. And in our country, I think it's going to matter more soon. In our country, we take our legal institutions, our laws that underwrite our society, we take that pretty much for granted because it's there and it's reliable and it's predictable. But it's under pressure in our country right now. And I think in the span of your careers, it's going to come under more pressure. We are living in a really volatile time. And to respond to that volatility to respond to shifts in people's sense of security, to respond to changing moods in politics and international relations, people are going to place pressure on some really basic fundamental principles of our legal system and our legal institutions. And there will be some basic elements that get disregarded in that process. And sometimes that will be deliberate. People will say, you know what, we need greater security, so we'll infringe some rights. Or we need greater certainty in relation to something, so we'll just shave a little bit off the system over here. So sometimes it'll be deliberate, sometimes it'll just be careless. Um, politicians will choose to do things or regulate things in ways where there are unintended consequences for the way in which our system works. And sometimes the law will be the problem, that in a society where things are changing so dramatically and so quickly, the law will be too slow to evolve. And so it will not protect rights and liberties that ought to be protected. 
because it just won't have caught up with what those rights and liberties need at a particular time. And as things become more global, as the influences on our society come from more places than where they come from now, some of the basic values that sit in our system will matter less. Sounds like a odd thing to say, but I think values have a life cycle just like anything else. And um, they come and they go depending on who the dominant influences are on your society. And so as our values start to change, or we start to spend more time engaged with people from places where the values are different, that will start to change the way in which values are perceived inside our legal system as well. And these things will matter not just in social justice, not just in the, the engagement of the law with broad community needs, it will happen also in you know, the business of the law, in the commercial part of the law. So the, you know, a lot of um, what you will be learning about is a system which is under pressure. And that means that you matter. If the law matters, then lawyers matter. Now, not all of you will want to be lawyers, but a lot of you will become lawyers. And those of you who don't practice as lawyers will be trained as lawyers. And so you will matter. You will matter a lot because of the skills that you will have from the education that you get here. The skills that you have in identifying issues, in discussing issues, in influencing others around issues are rare skills. You're really smart people, you will have those skills, but they're rare and they matter a lot. And if the law matters, then the people who are able to influence it and the people who are able to deliver it matter. So what you're embarking on here is actually pretty important and pretty serious. And it matters. And the education that you're going to get here at what I think is one of the greatest law schools in the world, big call, but I think it's true, and not just because I went here. <laughs> but the values that this law school is built around matter. And any legal education is a privilege, but I think an education here is a particular privilege. And privilege always comes loaded with responsibility on the other side. And the skills that you are going to develop will be needed and wanted. And you need to be ready to offer them. For some of you, the chance to offer them might come very early in your careers. For others, perhaps like me, it'll come much later in your careers. But the point is to be ready to offer them and to ensure that you have the skills and the experience and judgment to have impact when you do offer them. And so my next piece of advice, or maybe, maybe it's my first piece of advice, um, is don't be in too much of a hurry. Um, being good at the law is about experience, skill and judgment and it takes time to develop it. And traditionally legal careers have been really very clear and very linear. Uh, for you guys, your careers may be much more episodic. New ways of working are going to affect all the jobs in the world, including the jobs that you're going to be looking for. And that kind of episodic approach to work will have implications for a profession that is built on time and experience and the gaining of skill and judgment. And so for you guys, perhaps more than any other graduates that I've ever met, any other students I've ever met, any colleagues that I've worked with in my career, for you guys, there will be a real need for you to cur curate your own careers. Unlike me, you won't be able to join a firm when you're 23 or 24 and allow the escalator of your career just to take off. 
you will need to think carefully about what it is you want to do, the difference that you want to make, and how you're going to build the skills that you need to build in order to make that difference. So you'll need to, as I say, curate your career. And when you do it, I'd encourage you to focus on those ideas, that what you need to develop are experience, skills, and judgment, all built on a really solid base of knowledge which you will develop here at the law school. And if you're going to curate your own career, then you need to have a kind of solid core to build it around. And with that in mind, I want to finish um, by a couple of rules, I suppose, or suggestions. Maybe that's a better word than rules. These are things which I learnt by watching the great teachers that I had in my professional life. And you might want to keep them in mind as you're studying and as you're working your way into your careers as lawyers. The first is to take the law seriously. As I said before, it matters and it should be taken seriously. And you need to develop a kind of seriousness of purpose when it comes to being a lawyer and take the duties and obligations of the law seriously if you practice as a lawyer. The second rule is don't take yourself too seriously. Um, that is the great blight of the legal profession, people who just take themselves way too seriously. Take the work seriously. Take the institutions seriously. But don't take yourself too seriously, because if you take yourself too seriously, then you'll decide fairly early on in your career that you've made it, and there's really nothing else you need to learn, and you're, you're just fabulous. But the fact is, if you really want to have impact and effect in your career, then you need to be open to, be, to learning the whole way through. And you need to be bold in the experiences that you say yes to. And hopefully, like me, what you will find is the things that you least expected to influence you the most will influence you the most. And that the people that you weren't sure you were going to learn much from are going to be the people that you learn the most from. So don't take yourself too seriously. Be really open to the lessons that will come to you uh, as you spend time here at the law school and start working your way into the profession. And then be ready. Be ready for the request that will come to you because of the skills that you have. People who work in the law think that it's normal. They think that the world is full of really, really smart people who are hardworking and clear thinking and get things done. They are good skills of lawyers, but they don't actually exist in lots of other walks of life. And so what happens is that as you progress through your career as a lawyer, people start to ask you things. And sometimes it's, can you come onto this committee at the children's school? Or can, would you mind being the, on this board over here? Or could you help us? Uh, our community needs to do something which is different to what we've been doing before, and we actually need someone who can help navigate the way through. You will get asked, and uh, as I said before, it might happen quickly, it might happen a long time into your career. But when you do get asked, I would recommend you say yes, and that you just keep saying yes um, to those sorts of experiences. Um, I'm really jealous, actually, of the opportunity that all of you have. Um, I said before that our system is under a bit of pressure, or will come under more pressure. The legal profession, like everything else in the world, is under, uh, undergoing some very significant changes at the moment. And it's not a profession that's very good at change. And so the people who have all the opportunity, I think, are the people with the least invested in the status quo, and that's you. Right? You have a real opportunity as you begin to arrive in the profession in a few years' time to shape it for the next period of its history. That's one reason why I'm jealous. The other reason why I'm jealous is you're mostly in your 20s. Um, you're mostly at university, uh, and that's a pretty good thing. So um, congratulations on choosing this law school. Congratulations on being good enough 
to be here in this course and I wish you every success in your studies. Thanks very much.
it will always be possible to get involved in changing the world. And the question is, what degree of skill and experience do you want to bring to the job when you start it out? Thank you.